Um, so it's just great fun to be with you again this morning. And even though we can't gather in person, we can be together uh, online. And uh, the one thing that's awesome is we've become really good with this, haven't we? So we really figured this part out now, especially you guys. I can see you've got this thing running. It's awesome. And uh, so that's amazing. So we're just excited to, to share with you this morning. Wish you were here in person. But uh, God is still going to do something. And I'm just trusting that he's going to encourage you today. I'm trusting that he's going to just move in our hearts in interesting times, challenging times, times where I think lots of us are being pushed uh, uh, in, in lots of directions and in lots of different ways. Um, I so enjoyed the worship. I don't know who put the songs together, but, but thank you so much for that. And it's always fun when you guys basically sing my sermon so I can just kind of actually say amen and we can go home, all right? Um, but it was amazing. And um, so I want to share with you a little bit my journey uh, over the last three months or so. And hopefully it will give you a bit of encouragement and maybe just uh, give you some perspective on, on the season and about all the craziness that's happening around us because it is pretty crazy. Uh, it is interesting times that we are in. And I want to say to you, I want to start by just saying, I, I know Andre mentioned that in the beginning as well, but it really is a season of crushing. It really is a season of tasting. It, it, it's not just you. And some of you just actually need to hear that, that it's not just you who's feeling what you're feeling. It's not just you who's going through a really hard time and, and feel like, you know, it's a bit of an uphill battle right now. There definitely is an attack and an assault on the body of Christ globally. It's not just South Africa either, and it's not just because of the lockdown either. We, we are just in an interesting time, and, and I want to um, firstly say that to kind of just encourage you and to re relax you a little bit and maybe calm you down, because the worst part about where we're at right now is the fact that we actually feel super disconnected from each other in a way, right? Although we're doing what we can, in a way, we do feel isolated, and it's kind of a strange space that we are in because... Um, uh, you, you know, even though we're doing our best to stay connected, it is still hard to feel connected in some way. And when we see each other, it's in the running by or in the passing by, and you don't really get to share what's actually going on in your life, you know. And that makes us feel isolated. It makes me feel like it's just me. It's not just you. It's a bunch of us, okay? Um, about two months ago, the Lord started speaking to me, and, and that's why the song just blessed me this morning. And the Lord said to me, I need you to cast down your crown. Revelation chapter 4, what we were singing right now. And I thought, I have no, I, like, obviously I have some sort of an idea what that means. You know, biblically, I, I get the picture. It's, a, it's in Revelation chapter 4 where the four living creatures are worshiping before the throne. And it's amazing because the minute they start worshiping, the 24 elders, they fall to their knees and they worship. And after they worship, they cast down their crown. And that's what we were singing about this morning. And I felt God said, I need you to cast down your crown. And I'm going, you know, it's one of those Holy Spirit moments where you go, okay, yeah, sure. I don't really know what to do with that, but fantastic. Um, you know, a crown speaks of a lot of things. A crown speaks of your reward from God. Um, it speaks of that which he's bestowed on you in a certain season. And when he says something like, I want you to cast it down, in my mind, immediately, it means like there's an upgrade coming in the spirit. So if my old reward is something that he's saying, let that go, I want to give you something new now, that means we're moving into an upgrade. We're moving into something better. And I want to encourage you guys with that, that that's the season that we're in. But the story that kind of connects with that for me, we find in Mark chapter 10, um, it's become one of my favorite stories over the last three months. The last three months has been exceptionally hard for us as well, like I know it has been for you guys. It's been a challenging time. It's been a time where it felt like you're fighting with everything in you just to keep the ministry open, just to keep things going, just to not give up, to throw off the heaviness, to stay focused on God. It's just been challenging. And in the midst of this, these two things kind of came together. So I want to read the story of blind Bartimaeus. He's become my new hero in this season, right? So blind Bartimaeus, Mark chapter 10, verse 46, I'm reading out of the Amplified. It says, 
then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and the large crowd, a blind beggar, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road, as was his custom. When Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly rebuked him, telling him to keep still and be quiet. But he kept on shouting all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, telling him, take courage, get up. He's calling for you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, my master, let me regain my sight. Jesus said to him, go, your faith and your trust in my power has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following Jesus on the road, right? Famous story. We all know the famous cry of blind Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And as I've been thinking about this story and the whole thing of casting down my crown, I kept feeling like God speaking to me about, it almost feels to me like a bunch of us, we're, we're sitting like Bartimaeus next to that road and we are blind as a bat. <laughs> it's like, what in the world is going on? Like, we thought we had this thing figured out. We thought life was going in a certain way. We're contending for the right stuff. We're pressing into the kingdom. We're going for the miracles. We're going for the signs and wonders. We're going for discipleship. We're, we're doing our thing. We're, we're doing our business. We're doing family. We're living life the best we can according to the knowledge that we have. And suddenly we sit next to this road and we go, we can't see a thing. That's what, that's what I felt like. Maybe it wasn't you. Maybe it was just me. I don't know. And with that losing of sight, it does get a little bit heavy around you because it is not pleasant to walk when you can't see. It's not pleasant to navigate a season when it's difficult to understand the season. Agreed? It, it's hard to go and you know God is there. It's not, like, it's not like we're having a faith crisis in the sense of, oh no, I'm giving up on Jesus. Or It's not the point. It's just like, what in the world is happening? Why is it so hard right now? Why am I feeling so heavy? Why does it feel so difficult to connect with God? You know? <laughs> Why is there pressure on my marriage suddenly? Why is everything just, it's just different than it was before. And it's like, I looked at the story the other day and I thought, man, this is exactly what I feel like. It's just like, I can't see. I'm struggling to figure it out. I'm struggling to get what's happening in this season. I feel spiritually disconnected in a way, although I know I love Jesus. I'm spending time in the word. I'm spending time in prayer, but it's just not, there, you know, and many people are feeling that way. I don't know how you feel about it, but if I get one more message about a vaccine or a conspiracy, I, I'm going to throw up. I can't handle it anymore. If I, it's like, and, and I don't know if you've noticed, but apparently in the, the current season, you are only deeply prophetic if you're a conspiracy theorist. I'm like, man, just get over it, right? Like the real prophetic people are very deep into conspiracies. I'm like, man, just, just be, don't be ridiculous. Point people to Jesus. Be quiet. Nobody knows. Like, I don't know. I've, I've decided I don't know. I don't know about you, but I've just decided I don't know. I don't know what's the truth. I don't know if it's good. I don't know who to trust. So I'm just shutting up and I'm going to listen to Jesus. That's my personal opinion, right? And we just need to calm down and just say we don't know and just relax and get back to God because all of these things are adding to the blindness. Listen, we feel lied to because you have been lied to, right? We feel like, where am I supposed to look in this season? Because really, where am I supposed to look, right? Where, where is the help going to come from? We know the answer, but it, it, sometimes we need to be reminded of it. And we're sitting next to this road and we're just going, I don't know. And then it's like God just reminded me of Bartimaeus saying, hey, why did he shout? The shout was just simply this, Jesus Son of David, have mercy on me. I've never felt so strongly to press into mercy and grace as this season. Because I don't have it figured out. I don't know what to do. I, I don't have my ducks in a row. 
I don't feel like I'm hearing and seeing. I don't feel like everything is flowing in that way. And it feels like all that I have in my heart is just, I need your mercy like I've never needed it before. I need your grace like I've never needed it before because I surely don't have it together. I don't have the strength. I don't have the understanding. I'm struggling to see beyond my own feet at the moment. So mercy, God. And that's what Bartimaeus did. And I want to challenge you. That's what we are supposed to be doing in this season. Stop trying to have everything figured out and just cry out for mercy. Just, it's just the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God is what got me saved. The mercy of God is what got me baptized and filled with the Spirit. The mercy of God is what got me married. The mercy of God is what got me beautiful children. The mercy of God is what sustains me. It, 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 it's all it's been all this time. And anyway, but somehow at times we started feeling like something that I did made this thing happen. And then we're in a season where we're stripped and we go, it wasn't me. Like we know it. We always say it. It's all Jesus. I get it. But somewhere in there, it's like it's Jesus, but he might need a little bit of help from me. Otherwise, this thing is not going to work. And I'm at the place where I'm just going, I have no idea. Like this week again, my wife looked at me and some of the team is like, so what's the plan? I'm like, I don't have one. <laughs> I have no plan at all. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And lots of it because we're struggling. We're swimming and it's, it's getting intense. I feel like the blind guy. I feel like Bartimaeus. And I love it because the only thing he was doing is just crying crying out to God, saying, God, have mercy. God, come. God, do your thing. Um, God, see me. Don't forget me. Remember, I'm here. And here's the beautiful thing about it is that this blind guy recognized that Jesus is walking by. He, he heard about him, right? I mean, he's blind as a bat. He can't see. I don't know if it sound, sounds like he wasn't born blind. I'm not sure if I read the story because he says he regained his sight. So I don't, I don't know exactly what that means. But he's not seeing, but he recognizes the sound of, you know, of the king coming by. And, and I want to encourage you guys that doesn't matter what's going on. Can we just recognize that he's still near? He's still near. Like, we don't maybe see like we used to see. And it's a seasonal thing. I don't understand it completely. It's starting to turn for me. But he's still nearby. And he is calling. He's calling. Right? I, I love it because the more Bartimaeus cried out, the more the people said, shut up, be quiet, you're making a noise. And the louder he cries out. And then there's that moment, where is it? Verse 49, I think. Uh, yeah, verse 49, where Jesus, Jesus stopped and said, Call him. Isn't that awesome? Jesus stopped and said, call him. And I'm telling you, Jesus is looking at you. He's looking at me. He's looking at the church and he's going, hey, I'm calling. I'm calling. I'm calling. And I want to tell you, everything changes when he calls. Everything changes when Jesus calls your name. Everything changes when he recognizes your voice. And he is recognizing He's listening. He's hearing. He's not not listening. He's listening. I know it doesn't feel like it, but he's there and we just can't see. But if you can just be like him and just keep on crying out for mercy, despite the fact that you can't see, despite the fact that everybody's telling you, shut up, don't make a noise, don't gather, <laughs> don't worship, right? Despite all of that, He's listening and he's calling us and he's saying, I'm calling my church. I'm calling my true bride. I'm calling. Right? And Bartimaeus knew that that is the change. That is the moment that we're waiting for is can he just speak? You know, I said to my wife a couple of months ago, I'm like, I literally feel like I'm going to die if he doesn't start talking to me because I cannot handle this silence. I, I can't handle it. It's like I, I can't live with it. I don't know about you, but I, 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 feel, I get extremely nervous when it goes quiet like that. I'm just like, God, this is, I'm, this is not normal to me. Where are you? I need to hear you. I need to feel you. And it was just quiet for months. It's just like hell broke, broke out. It, it, it's like, what is going on? You know? And then he just says, cast down your crown. And I'm going, thank you. 
<laughs> That's not making me feel better right now, but yay, you know, but I'm on a journey. And then I see a blind guy crying out next to the road, and for the first time, I'm feeling like I'm the blind guy. I'm going, okay, I don't know how this is supposed to make me feel better, but it does, because it gives me perspective. Verse 49, so they called the blind man, telling him, take courage, get up, he's calling for you. Listen, he, he is calling for every single one of us. He's calling. If he's telling me to cast down my crown, it means he's calling. There's an upgrade coming. There's something about to be released. And we've been pushing and we've been hitting walls and we've been going all kinds of directions. But he's calling. Take courage. Take courage. Right? Something is about to shift. Something is about to happen. And the reality is the minute that we can lift our gaze to heaven, things change. The minute that we turn to Jesus, things always change, right? In Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 and 35, you know, it's that lovely story where King Nebuchadnezzar uh, turned into a beast of the field for seven years, right? You remember that story? It's like, I love the Bible because it's like all these stories and we read them we're like, oh yeah, I remember that story. But imagine the news report on Fox News or CNN or SABC where it goes, yeah, we just found out that the president of China turned into a beast uh, for about seven years. He was eating grass and just living in the field. And, but after seven years, he got it together now. Don't worry about it, right? That's basically what happened. And we all go, oh, yeah, I remember that story. No, that's a pretty big deal. Oh, no, Joe Biden just turned into a beast of the field for about seven years, and he's been eating grass and so on. Uh, but don't worry, guys, he's fine now, right? That's what happened, right? God is awesome. He's amazing. He's strange, right? <laughs> But listen, this is the end of that story. It says, but at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, listen to these words, raised my eyes toward heaven. I want you to hear that. This guy is eating grass. He's turned into a beast. His hair is long. He's gross, right? He lost it. And then he goes, I raised my eyes towards heaven and my understanding and reason return to me. Man, that's powerful. That's powerful. That's blind Bartimaeus going on that road. I can't see a thing, but I'm turning my eyes to Jesus. Have mercy on me, son of David. Have mercy. And the minute that he did it, understanding and reason came back to him. Something shifted. And then he goes on and he says, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Isn't that powerful? Just in that minute of turning His eyes towards Jesus, understanding comes back, reason comes back, and worship erupts out of His heart. And He goes, listen, I don't know what happened to me. I, I've been eating grass for about seven years. <laughs> I've been eating whatever the world's been feeding me for about, you know, 18 months. I've been consumed with all the challenges in my life. I've been consumed with disappointment. I've been eating rubbish because it's just been hard. And I don't know what happened, but suddenly I turned my eyes to Jesus and, man, I got understanding and I remembered that His kingdom is an everlasting one. And his dominion will not come to an end. And he will reign forever. And I'm still smelly and my hair is still long, but something happened. You know? And that, that's it. That's what he wants. Hebrews 12, verse, verse 1 and 2. Right? Hebrews 12, verse 1. We're a beautiful verse. We all know it. But, but verse 1, it says, Therefore, therefore what? Verse, chapter 11 is about the heroes of the faith. Right? It's about all these giants of the faith that did these amazing things for God. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, listen, I want to encourage you that there is a Moses and a Paul and a David and an Elijah and an Elisha and heroes of the faith sitting in the realm of the Spirit cheering you on, saying, you can do this. You can do this, right? They're going and saying, listen, I know you feel this is hard. Um, I was beheaded back then, but, but no worries. Uh, you guys just keep going, right? You're going to be fine because you have something that we didn't have. You have Jesus. You have Jesus. 
We didn't have the salvation that you have. We didn't have the mercy that you have. You have it. And they're going, you can really do this. And they're praying and they're encouraging and they're cheering us on. And they're going, don't give up. Could you just lift your eyes? That's what they're saying. I'm sure if they could speak. And they go on and they say, stripping off, listen to this, stripping off every unnecessary weight and the sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us. We are so entangled. We are so heavy at the moment. And listen to me. I'm not talking about you sinning. As I'm not trying to put anything on you. I'm just saying sin is about more than just drinking and beating your wife, although that is obviously unacceptable, right? But sin has a capacity and an ability to entangle us. And it's not always your sin. It's just what's going on in the realm around you. And it gets heavy. And we are entangled. And we struggle to get through this thing. And we feel like, why can't we move? Why are we so stuck? Why is it so heavy? Friends, it is because hell doesn't like us. It's because the enemy is trying to destroy us. It's because there is an assault on believers globally. And that is why you're feeling heavy. That is why I've been feeling heavy. Right? Because it's hard. The enemy is trying to take us out. He is. And I'm saying this to encourage you because he will lose. <laughs> he will lose. But sometimes the issue is that we don't realize what's going on around us and we think, why is it just me? No, it's not just you. It's an attack on the body, on the stuffed animals and all of us, right? And we feel like stuffed animals, some of us, right? <laughs> and God is saying, no. There's this cloud of witnesses encouraging you saying, do not be entangled, be, get loose, get loose from the stuff. What is keeping you down? What is the grass you're feeding on that is keeping you like a beast of the field, right? What is this stuff that we're feeding on that's not helping right now? And it's not our own strength, but we need mercy. We need to cry out, mercy, mercy, mercy. Just have mercy because we don't have it together. Help. It's not my strength. It's not my ability. It's none of those things. It's just surrender. It's just surrender. We just need to go, God, we don't have this figured out, but I'm just going to fall into you. And then it goes on and it says, um, it says, let us run. Did you hear that? Let us run with endurance and active persistence, the race that is set before us. What does active persistence look like if you're a blind guy sitting next to the road? What does it look like? It looks like this. Mercy. That's what it looks like. It looks like crying out when everybody's telling you to shut up. And you keep saying, Jesus. And you go, listen, I don't even have the strength to cry out to Jesus. I get that too. Maybe stop crying out and just be a friend. Just be the guy that says, Jesus, I'm struggling. I really need a friend again. I just need you next to me and persistently keep running the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract us, focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. That's it. That's it. Listen. I came to this point. I started the whole month of June. I've been doing conferences and preaching in places and I show up and I'm thinking, I have no idea what to talk about because I'm not feeling on fire. I'm not feeling like that guy at the moment. I'm feeling like I need ministry. Now I need to minister to you. <laughs> and then he just told me, can you just talk about me for a while? Oh, yeah, I can do that. You see, Jesus, you know that, but like for Bartimaeus, he is everything. He's everything. I don't want revival anymore. I want the one that gives revival. I don't want a healing or a miracle anymore. I want the one who's doing it. I don't, I love church, but it's not about this building. It's about Jesus. 
It's not about fellowship. It's about Jesus, although it's important. It's not about giving. It's about Jesus. It's not about how many verses do I know. It's about do I know Jesus. It's, it's Jesus. It's, it's all that matters is Jesus. It's just Him. He is the finisher, the author and the pioneer of my faith. He is the living water. He is the breath of life. He is the door. He is the resurrection. He is the life. There is nothing outside of Him. Everything is held up together by Him. Colossians 1 verse 17. Everything is sustained because of Him. He wasn't created by anyone, but He created everything and He holds all things together. He is the head of the church. Everything needs to be filled with Him. Everything is for His glory. Everything is for His honor. It's really just about Jesus. It's Him. It's not about what revelation I can find. He is the revelation. It's not about these deep mysteries. He is the mystery unveiled. It's Jesus. It's just Jesus. There really is nothing else. When we are broken, when we are disappointed, when we are feeling like we're done, I don't know. I don't have the answer, but I know there's Jesus. It's Jesus. Be vac vaccinated. Don't be vaccinated. I don't know, but I know I need Jesus. I need Him. There's really nothing else that this story is about. You see, you're never going to get your new crown unless it starts in the place of worship. Right? Without worship, I'm not getting a crown. Because out of worship, you go, I'm willing to give everything up that's ever been given to me. Right? Bartimaeus in verse 50, it says, when he heard that Jesus cried out, he jumped up cast off his beggar's cloak, right? Listen, Bartimaeus was also casting off his crown. And here's the crazy part. He was still blind. Bartimaeus hasn't seen yet. He's still blind. He just heard a voice saying, come. And he jumps up and he throws off the old mantle, the old crown, the old anointing, the old thing. Why? Because Jesus is calling and he's going, I just need to be with this guy. I just need to be with him and life is going to be okay. So this blind guy throws off his mantle and he just starts running. I don't know how far away Jesus was, but he's still a blind guy running. Right? I'm still a blind guy running. But I'm casting off stuff and I'm going into worship because none of it matters, right? Right? Joseph got a coat from his father. He got his technicolor coat from his father, remember? But it could not take him to the palace. Couldn't. Moses was the prince of Egypt. But it could not take him up a mountain where he sat with God for 40 days and nights. Nothing that man has placed on us can lead us into what he has for us. And there's only one, there's only one that can give you the crown. There is only one that can give you the mantle for the season. There is only one that can reposition us in the right place. It's Jesus. It's Him. There is only one that knows what we need to do tomorrow, what the future holds. It's Him. You know, I'm challenging myself. How many times have I cried out for revival? How many times have I said, Lord, let it come? And then I keep forgetting that He is revival. It's Him. How many times have I cried out for the glory to come and fill a place visibly and then I realize, but it's Him. Healing, and then I realize, it's Him. It's Him. It's Jesus. There is no other way. Son of David, have mercy on me. Just have mercy on me. I just want to be your friend. I just want to sit next to you. I just want to worship you. That's all I want to do. I don't need answers right now, right? It's the hardest part in life, but I don't need answers right now. I've made peace with that this month. I just said, I don't need answers now. I'm not seeking him for a blueprint. I'm not seeking him for direction. I'm not seeking him for healing. I'm seeking him for him. I want to hear my friend's voice. I need it, right? And something changed in me because of it. I can feel the shift. Something has become lighter. I still don't know what tomorrow holds. I still don't know what's going to happen in a month from now. But suddenly my friend is talking to me again. And we're just hanging out. That's all. 
And it's hard. As a body, as a part of the family, I know you guys have been through a lot. I know you guys have had challenges over the last couple of months, and my heart breaks for you. It really does. Right? It's not been easy. But a verse that I thought of, and I might have shared it here, but it's, it's Hebrews 11. It says, it's one of those hard verses because Hebrews 11 is just the faith heroes. It's just like, oh, man, they did all these awesome things. And then Hebrews 11, verse 35, it's about these couple of ladies. It starts and it says, women received back their dead by resurrection. And you go, oh, that's the good stuff, right? That's the story that we want. And they are seen as heroes of the faith. Next part of the verse. And others were tortured to death. Refusing to accept release. Offered on the condition of denying their faith. So that they would be resurrected to a better life. And I thought about it this morning again when I thought about you guys. And I just want to say that faith... Faith looks as different sides to it. Sometimes it's that dead baby being resurrected back to life. But sometimes it looks like hardship happening and you did not deny your faith. And both made it into the hall of fame in heaven. Both were applauded and is applauded by heaven. Both is celebrated by God saying that I've seen you contending and you did not deny your faith. You've had loss, you've had challenge, loved ones, and God goes, I see how you kept on contending every time. You didn't back down from what you saw in me. And the Lord says that is worthy of reward. That is worthy of honor. And we are standing a little bit on the side, and I want to encourage you guys to say we've been watching you in that sense, and you might feel something different, but we've been looking at it and going, we commend you. You guys are doing amazing because you are standing on what you believe. That's also looking at Jesus. Does it make it easier? No. Was it easy to be tortured for those women? I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Does heaven applaud them? Yes, because there is a faith that is more precious than gold, refined by the fire, right? Refined by the fire. And what do we do when we're in the fire? Jesus, son of David, you have mercy on us because this is hard. This is hard, Lord. This is hard. But he's hearing, right? Psalm 34, verse 5, it says, they looked to him and were radiant, right? Their faces will never blush in shame or confusion. I love it because, again, it's a bunch of people that decided we're going to look at God. We're going to look at him, and we don't have the answers. We don't have it figured out. It's not easy. We're not going to contain. We're not going to do that right now. We're going to rest. And how do we do that? We're just going to look. And he says, and as they looked at him, their faces were radiant, radiant, radiant. Do you believe that you can shine in this time despite what you're feeling on the inside? We can. And they, they, you, they will never blush in shame or confusion. Why? Because what did they do? They looked at him. They just looked at him. We don't have it figured out. But we're going to look at him. And because of that, something Good is going to come out of this. Something good is going to happen. You see, so the blind guy is running, gets to Jesus, and Jesus says, okay, so what do you want from me? Right? And the obvious answer is, I want to see. And Jesus goes, go, your faith has made you well. Again, I want to challenge you. What does faith look like in the season when we don't feel like we're strong? What does it look like? God, I need mercy. That's what it looks like. And God looks at him and he says, wow, man, you've got amazing faith. I'm going to heal you. Right? 
I don't know if Bartimaeus, I don't know what he really believed on the inside, but he understood mercy. He understood mercy. And because of it, he's seeing today. I want to say to you, if we just press into mercy, we're going to see. We're, the eyes are going to open. We're going to be able to get perspective again. We're going to stand up. We're going to be radiant. We're going to run forward because Jesus is with us, right? I want to encourage you today just to do that. It's simple. It's not a complicated message. <laughs> it's probably the simplest word there is. Basically, look to Jesus. That's it. But you know what? It changes lives. It does change our lives. We had corona the last two weeks. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, that he protected us. And that it wasn't that serious, although it sucks. But, you know, we didn't have a lot of energy. We're tired most of the time. I don't know if you guys had it, but it's like exhausting. You walk to the door and you're tired and, you know. Um, I didn't pray the hours that I would like to, but I felt his fellowship the whole time. I just felt him with me. And we weren't fighting for anything. We're not trying to figure anything out. We're just going, Jesus, we're here. And he responds, right? So I want to pray for you guys at home. I want to pray for you wherever you're at. I want to encourage you. And I want us to do this together. You know, Song of Songs, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, it speaks uh, in the Passion Translation. It says, let him love you. Isn't that something? Let him kiss you with the kisses of his mouth. And I want to tell you, this is what we need to learn. In Song, Song of Songs 2, I think it's verse 4, it speaks about how I've decided, the bride says, I'm going to sit under your grace shadow. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to sit under your grace shadow. That's exactly what Bartimaeus did. Just going to sit here. I don't have it figured out. And then it ends, that, that those verses, it ends with, and I'm going to stay here because your glory abounds here forever. If you want to live in the glory and the presence of God, sit under the gray shadow of the Lord. That's it. And then it goes on and it says, and I looked at him and suddenly he transported me into his house of wine. Isn't that awesome? Suddenly the bride ends up in the house of wine of the king. The house of wine speaks about the spirit. It speaks about the new covenant. It speaks about the blessing and the mercy of God. And all we need to do is just say, let him love you. Let him kiss you with the kisses of his mouth for your sweet love is better than wine, right? And some of us just need to let him love us, okay? And that's what I want you to do this morning. So wherever you're at, as the worship team also comes up, come up I'm just going to pray a prayer and then give over to them and Andre and wherever you guys want to lead is fine. But let's just take a moment and just where you're at, just sit there and close your eyes and I want to pray for you. And let's turn our eyes to him. Let's just turn our eyes to Jesus. No agenda. We don't have to do anything this morning. You don't have to do anything. In fact, just let him love you. You say, I don't even know how to do that. I know. Aren't we useless? <laughs> Aren't we strange? We don't even know how to let him do that. That's where mercy comes in. And we just sit there and we just go, Jesus, would you love me today? Because I am pretty sure I need it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be undone unless you come. And Lord, I want to pray this with everybody watching right now. And just say, Lord, we turn our hearts to you. And we just say, Lord, have mercy on me. I need your love. I need that house of wine. I need to be intoxicated by your love like never before. Not because I understand, not because I have it figured out, but I know your love is what sustains me. Lord, I need to just breathe and sit under that grace tree, under that grace shadow where your glory abides. <laughs> sure. Where your glory abides forever. I want to live in your glory. So I run to grace right now. Grace has a name. It's Jesus. Mercy has a name. It's you, Jesus. Love has a name. It's you, Jesus. Forgiveness has a name. It's you. And Lord, I just want to sit here and pray that you wash over me. Your sweet love is better than wine. So Lord, I want the wine of your love right now. And maybe it feels strange to you, but right there we are. Just open up and just say, Lord, 
You know, David says, and I think it's Psalm 118, he says, I'm going to lift high the cup of my salvation. David saw it. He was a visual guy. And maybe some of you just need to see the cup of his love right now and just drink. Just say, Lord, I'm just drinking. I know you feel silly. I get it. So do I. But if it helps you, let it help you. How do you love him like this? You just stand there and you go, I love you. I love you. And as you do it, he does something back. He starts whispering again how much he loves you. He say, draw me into your heart, God. Pray that with me. Say, draw me into your heart. Just draw me in. Lord, I don't have the strength. But I, will, I know I want to be with you. So, Lord, I just declare, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you. Would you pour out your love on me? Would you make me drunk with your love? Would you take me into the house of wine? Would you refresh me in that place? Would you revive me in that place? Would you open my eyes, Lord? I want to pray for people's eyes to be opened. It feels blind in this season. Lord, let them be like Nebuchadnezzar and just look up. We're looking up right now, Lord, and I pray that understanding and reasoning will come back. I pray that worship will erupt in our hearts. Thank you for the new crown that's coming. Thank you for the new mantle that is coming, because it is coming. It is coming. Definitely. I know it's coming, God. And whenever it comes, it's going to be glorious. But until then, we're going to worship you. We're just going to worship you. So, Lord, even as we sing this song, I pray that heaviness will fall off of people, that despair will fall off, that questions will fall off, and that joy will be restored, Lord. Not because it's easy, but because Jesus is joy. Because Jesus is in my life. Jesus lives inside of me. Jesus is around me. Jesus is to the right of me and to the left of me. Jesus is in front of me. Jesus is behind me. Jesus is always, everywhere with me, forever King, forever Lord, forever reigning, forever in control, forever watching over me, forever having me in your hand. Jesus, I bow to you because you are worthy. Jesus, I bow to you because you are powerful and you are life, Lord. And I worship and I give you my praise and I say, no more, Lord, looking to the left or to the right. I'm not going to do it. I refuse, I refuse to go into doubt again. I love to close our word for doubt. It's the word tanda buzo, which is very interesting because I'm, I'm not an expert, but tanda means love, buzo means question. So doubt is when you love the question. Isn't that a perfect description? We go into the cycle of just loving the question, just doubting and questions and questions and loving the question and going on and on. And we, we, we are in despair. We're, we're, we're negative and we don't know why. It's because we're loving the question. Just let the question go right now. And we just say, Jesus, you are the answer. You are the key. And we're going to look at you. So Lord, have mercy on us. In the name of Jesus.